Okay, let's pick up where we left off. In the last video, we created our new um, machine learning workspace in Azure. And uh, if you don't see this screen, what I want you to do is to simply go back up here to the upper right, go to home, and then you'll see all of these resources and these two new recent resources. So here's the, the machine learning workspace that I created called Learning Space and the resource group called Education. So again, keep in mind and remember that Learning Space is just a, um, a resource inside of this education folder, or that's basically what a resource group is. So click here and let's get started. Uh, brings you to this page where it gives us details of uh, the learning space that we created. Um, by the way, before I go into it, uh, you can keep track of your uh, a variety of other things over here. So you can give access to this workspace to other people. I'm not going to go into the details of using Microsoft's IAM system, um, but you can give people the ability to run pipelines, create pipelines, depending on what you want. I also commonly access things like uh, properties um, of, of various uh, Azure services in general. Um, for example, if you're making a SQL Server, you can find uh, relevant authentication information, connection strings, things like that that you need here. Anyway, back to overview. I'm going to just click on this Launch Studio. It's the same thing as clicking on this Studio Web URL. Now, if you want to, you can copy that and bookmark it and just go straight to this so you don't have to log in through uh, the Azure portal first. Uh, it's probably a good idea. Um, here are the names of the storage key vault insights that were automatically created along with this machine learning workspace. So anyway, let's go ahead and, oh, also my subscription. Yeah, let's see if it'll let me change or modify that in case it's needed. I don't think so. It doesn't look like it in this case. Uh, but the, the subscription is what gives me the ability to, it's how they charge me, so to speak, for the resource. Um, and I can come here to my details of my subscription. You can check my remaining credit. That's a pretty useful thing. Let's check my balance. Okay, perfect. So still have my total credit, which means I haven't been using anything that costs money yet. I've just been using free services. Uh, and there's my Azure for Students account. Spent 330 cents so far. All right, not bad. All right, close that out. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to my uh, learning space and then click on either this link or Launch Studio. And the first thing I wanna do is just get some data uploaded. Let me walk you through some of these options here. Uh, so this is gonna fill, the first time you go in here, you might get this little uh, tutorial thing that walks you through what all these pieces are. I'm just gonna explain the same things to you here. So here's where we create here under author, and there's three ways we, cre we create. And if you're familiar with the classic version, of Azure Machine Learning Studio, then you're familiar with what they call here the designer. And you never had these other two options. So we'll give you uh, uh, examples of how all three of them work in this playlist. Uh, but for now, I'm going to focus on the designer since that's uh, most people watching this playlist will be using it to use this point and click tool. However, these other tools are incredibly useful as well. Um, automated ML, this is a service that uh, AWS, Amazon Machine Learning has as well. This is where I can just simply upload a data set and then mark the label and tell it what I want to predict. And it will run every possible combination of algorithm and feature set until it, it gets the best possible prediction and um, lets you use that as a pipeline fully built. Kind of nice. When I teach this class, a lot of students always ask, uh, Boy, there's so much work going through and testing everything out in the designer. Can't they just automatically try everything for me? Yes, they can. It's right there. But you won't learn what's going on inside the black box if we go straight to that tool, which is why we're going to focus on using the designer. Now, I have another series of, of uh, videos and books where we use this one instead of the designer. This is where we go through and write everything from Python code instead of using this point-and-click tool in designer. As you get more mature in your machine learning, 
uh, skills, I would recommend shifting to notebooks eventually because this is going to give you the most uh, the ability to customize exactly what you want. And and I, I like the designer tool. It's a great way to shift from Azure Classic to this portal. But my feelings are long run. This is best for learning. And eventually you'll want to shift to notebooks and possibly use the automated ML for use cases where you don't need a lot of customization and you want it just to automatically try everything for you. So they're all useful, have their uses. By the way, Amazon also has this notebooks feature. They call it SageMaker. Uh, the only thing Amazon doesn't have is this designer tool, uh, which is a, a nice way for Microsoft to differentiate itself. So even though uh, Azure has a bunch of built-in data sets, I want us to upload our own here. So click here on data sets. And again, assets, this is where everything we create is stored. So anything we create up here will be available in experiments or pipelines, models, and endpoints. So these are, uh, we'll go through them one by one. We'll, we'll start here at the data set. So click on create data set. And we're going to choose from local file, but just know that you can't have an Azure-based SQL Server uh, or an API. Um, you, you can pull from a variety of places, but we're going to use a local file for now. We'll call this our insurance data set. Now, this is the data set form you want it to become after you upload the file. When you click on this, don't be confused and think, oh, it's file that I'm uploading. No, we've already specified um, where the data is coming from. This is what the, the format we want it to be in, and this is what it needs to be for us to use it in the designer. Give it a description if you want. Um, I'm just going to click next. Uh, it says, all right, let's find a place to keep this. And this is that workspace blob store. It's kind of like um, an S3 bucket in Amazon. Uh, uh, but anyway, this is where it'll store it. Great. Click on this. Upload files. We can also upload a folder full of um, full of data, uh, but I'm going to keep it simple for now and just upload these one at a time. So if you're watching this through YouTube, I'll put a, a link to this data set in the description. Uh, if you're in the book, you should be able to find a download um, link within the book. Uh, won't skip validation. If it's a huge data set you're uploading and you know it's good, you might want to skip validation. But this is a pretty small one. So I'll just let it validate. Okay, it says here's what we find, um, and here's our preview. We just eyeball it, make sure it looks good, and everything ended up in the right columns. If this is your first time seeing this data set, uh, this is uh, each row represents a customer of a health insurance company, and at the end here we have how much that customer cost the health insurance company in I don't know a year period or something like that. Next to each name, it shows the suggested data type. 0.0, .0 means it's a float, means it has decimals. ABC means it's a, um, obviously it's an object or a string. Children here, it sees 1, 2, 3 means it's an integer. Um, BMI also a float. Uh, we're not going to skip any rows. Everything looks good here. We're just going to go ahead and click Next. Okay, it gives us a bit more detail on the data types. You could use this. For example, sometimes you might have a, a categorical feature like region. And in this case, there's four values of region, uh, region southwest, southeast, um, northwest, and northeast. It's just showing the first few rows here as an example. Um, and it could be that rather than using text, it's been coded like one, two, three, four. Now, if, we, if your data is in that format, it's going to think that it's an integer. But the problem with that is an integer implies that there's an order and a rank to the values, and whichever region is coded as two is going to be more region than whichever one is coded as one, but that doesn't make conceptual sense. It's not like children, where one child is more than zero. You can't have one region that's more region than another. So uh, we need to make sure that it's treated categorically. So if this were to have come in, you know, with one, two, three, four, you can change it from integer here to a string so that it treats it as a categorical variable, even though it came in a number format. That's why you might want to use a string, this, uh, this page right here. Anyway, go ahead and hit next. It says, does this look all look good? We're not going to click this. It lets us have sort of a, um, a recipe for importing data that we can use for more data sets. And we're not going to worry about it. We didn't make any modifications, so we're just going to hit create. 
All right, pulls it in, goes through a validation process, and puts it here in our registered data sets. Um, we're not going to worry about data set monitors. This monitors how our data sets change over time. Uh, we won't worry about that for now. So we've got our data set. Uh, next thing you want to do is go to the designer, and we're going to make a new experiment. So up here are a bunch of sample experiments we can use uh, that have a variety of tasks we might want to perform on a different data set. So we can use them as templates for how we do our own. And uh, they've done a great job here from a basic regression. Um, let's see, a regression where it compares multiple algorithms. Uh, that's something we'll, we'll get into and use for sure. Image classification is a new feature. If you're familiar with the uh, uh, machine learning classic platform, they didn't have this example there before. Uh, text classification, uh, this is great. We'll probably use some of these as examples at some point. But for now, let's just make a, a blank experiment. Okay, we have over here our set of pill options. These are pieces of functional logic that can be performed. You might think of it, uh, let me come down here to like data transformation. You might think of these as scripts of Python or R code that you might write to accomplish a task. And all they do is they, they bundle it into what you'll see what I mean in a second here by a pill. Um, and it writes the code for you automatically without you having to have any coding background. So that's what this playlist is for. And this particular book is for those who don't have a programming background, or maybe you do and you just want to learn and see how this point and click tool works. But we're going to build out an experiment and I guess a better term for it is a full pipeline that pulls data in, models it, and then spits out a prediction uh, at the end, uh, and then measures the quality of that prediction. And we're going to do all of it from click and drag uh, visual tools here without writing code. So this first one here, you'll notice data sets. Here's our insurance data set we just uploaded. There are all these sample data sets as well that are used for those sample experiments that we saw on the last screen. Um, however, we're on the um, we're on the cheapest option, and it doesn't have uh, sorry, the, the lowest level here of machine learning compute power. We're going to get to that in a second. And it is pretty slow with large data sets. So I'm going to steer clear of these as much as I can because some of them are pretty big. And I'm going to have you use some of my own data sets that are smaller and won't make you make, wait quite as long. So here, notice I can click and drag. That's what I did right here. Click on this, drag it in. And now I have my first pill. Every pill has zero to many inputs and zero to many outputs. So the dots represent inputs are on the top, outputs are on the bottom. So if I click off of this pill, then I see the full screen. When I click on it, I get the properties window over here. Properties and parameters, I guess. There's not really a lot of parameters we can change uh, with the data set, so we're just gonna uh, leave it as it is and do nothing. Um, but we can also explore it. Right click, and we have this preview data option. And this will give us, like it says, a preview. Let us see how many rows and columns we're working with. Um, I like this feature right here because I can click on something like age. Let me stretch this out. There we go. And it gives us a very brief, oh, I'm trying to stretch this, but it won't let me. Oh, well, that's fine. Gives us some brief descriptive statistics. Now, I'm going to assume that when you've gotten to this point, you've already done some exploratory data analysis ahead of time. But it does give us a few uh, um, descriptive stats and visualizations as reminders. So univariate properties right here, no missing values, um, zero unique values. I'm not sure how it came up with that. Um, well, that's fine. Numeric type, mean, median, min, max, and here's a, uh, a frequency chart for us of all the values. Okay, great. Let's uh, close this out. And next, let's bring in just a single pill to run some analysis, uh, additional exploratory analysis on this, just so we can see how the pipeline works. So this pill is called, and we can search for them by name. I, They've changed these over time, and I, I don't know where to find everything off the top of my head because I've just gotten so used to using this search feature, which I like. Summarize data. There we go. Click and drag this one in here. And you'll notice that summarize data has both an input and an output. 
This is nothing more than functional logic to generate a bunch of summary statistics on a data set. So for this to work, you've got to connect the data into here. And you can see the red on the circle means that our experiment, our pipeline won't run uh, unless this is connected into, it's mandatory. So we're going to click on the output of insurance and notice that it, it highlights this one right there. If an input, it knows that I'm, I'm, I'm pulling this from, an, uh, from a data set. And so it knows my arrow is going gonna, is gonna to send data somewhere. If this input is a possibility, if it's allowed to connect, it highlights it and I can drop it in. Uh, sometimes it won't be highlighted because it knows that I'm pulling from a certain type of data, which is not allowed into that input. We'll give some examples of that later. All right, with summarized data, no parameters we can set or adjust. Uh, all we can do now is run this, which we come up here to click Submit. And it's going to give us an error. Good. Over here, it says select compute target in settings panel. Well, what is a compute target? Well, in, if you're familiar with the classic version, it, uh, it handled all this in the background for us. And so you wouldn't be familiar with it. Uh, in Azure Machine Learning Studio Classic, uh, when you created your pipeline just like this, your experiment, it automatically created a virtual machine that does the actual processing. It gives you the computing power to process this data and run these analyses. Right now, all you've done is build a file. We haven't actually processed the data. So we have to build a compute target first. Uh, so what we're gonna do is come over here to compute. Oh, I wanna save these changes first. Click my save button. All right, and I can create my compute target in a couple of places. So even though there is no parameters we can set to summarize data, let's take a look at some of these other options we have. So output settings, this is where do you want the results to be stored. This is that same place where we're storing uh, the original CSV file. Great, what are run settings? Oh, okay, here we go. This says use default compute target, no compute target selected change default, meaning I just don't have a compute target right now. I could either come over here and create it here, or it'll let me do it from right here. So I click on that change default, and it says select uh, compute type. Well, I need a compute instance. I've got none found. I'm going to create one. And it says, OK, give it a name. I'm going to call this learning compute. This, I want to make it as cheap and as small as possible. So uh, I'm going to leave my location east. Oh, that already exists because I created that er earlier. Learning computer. Oh, oh it's got to be, uh, there we go. Learning computer. So you might have to make sure it says it needs to be unique across all compute targets within the region that I'm in. Um, so you might want to use initials or something like that. It says, uh, okay, um, do you want a CPU or GPU? Well, I don't want to get into this right now. There's different types of data that are better processed with a graphics processing, a graphics processor than your CPU. Uh, but for now, everything we'll, we're, we'll use will be best with a, a CPU. Virtual machine size, let's see. Let's just see what all options are here. It doesn't give us a list of prices. Obviously, we're going to want to do the cheapest possible one so that we save our credit. Uh, general purpose memory optimized. Let's see. Standard is going to be more than we'll probably want. Let's go back to recommended options. Standard two core. Development on notebooks uh, and lightweight testing. Um, I think this is gonna be what we'll want. Let's just see if there's anything smaller than that. So we have two cores, 14 gigs of RAM, 28 gig storage. We won't need a lot of storage. This looks very similar to this one right here. I don't see any difference. So let's just stick with this one then right here. Standard, um, it's the smallest option when I go to the recommended options right here. All right, next advanced settings. Um, 
Oh, this is nice. We can make it automatically start up and shut down uh, so that we're not paying for it to be running when we're, um, uh, when we're not using it. So let's see what options we have here under add schedule. Um, so I'm going to make sure that it, if I haven't shut it down myself, that it automatically shuts down at a certain time each night and is only active on certain days. This is a great idea. Um, I think I'll leave this just like it is uh, and click create. So notice I should have pointed out there on that last screen, it said those are the times that we stop the instance. That means we'll still have to come here and turn it on each time we want to use it every time we log in. Uh, so we've got that created. Now we can select it right here. Oh, actually, sorry, it's still in the process of being created. It's just not telling us that. If I come up here, let's see, notifications. Uh, provisioning has succeeded, but it's still not created yet. Probably have to give it a couple minutes. It's spinning up this actual instance right now. So let me go back to my run settings. Uh, no new change default compute target. Select an instance. Let's refresh it here first. It's going to let me select. Not quite yet. Oh, here we go. 15 cents an hour. So it gives us an idea of how much this is going to cost us. I'm going to pause the video until it's ready um, and it'll let me select it. Uh, and actually, while I'm still waiting, I want to show you something. How do I know it's still creating this? Well, come over here and click on your Manage Compute. And it shows you computing instances. And we just made this one. And it's still, its current state is still here in creating mode. And so that's how I know it's still being uh, spun up. And this often will take a couple minutes. It's not, uh, it's, that's normal. So I'll pause again and wait for this to finish. Okay, mine just finished. It's now running. Let me come back here to my uh, either designer or I can go to pipelines. I can find uh, the one I made either way. Oh, I never published as a pipeline, so it's not quite there yet. Uh, it is here under Experiments or Designer, Basic Summarized Data uh, or Pipeline created right here. Both of these should take me back. Uh, oh, nope, this one doesn't take me back to that place. I'm glad I checked, though. So go back to Designer, uh, click on the Pipeline. And now we can come back here and click on our, uh, well, click anywhere. Um, and well, I guess we do have to have one of these selected and go to outputs, uh, sorry, run settings. And uh, let's change default compute target to the one we just created. There we go. Um, we also could have um, just selected a different compute target and grabbed it the same way. But this is all good. We got what we need. Um, let's go ahead and click submit. So in Azure Machine Learning Studio Classic, it would call this a pipeline run. Every time we ran it, it would save it as a unique run. And we never had to deal with it. It always was just sort of saved behind the scenes. You might have found them if you were scrolling through and looking at some of the save as options. But here in their production environment, they want to be a lot more explicit about keeping track of each run so we can note changes in them. So it makes us a little bit more thoughtful and intentional about each pipeline one we run we create, making sure that we have all of our settings right. It's not a problem if we get things wrong. Uh, that's expected that we'll have to do some experimenting. Uh, but anyway, for this one, uh, this experiment is what was created. Um, that You saw that basic summarize experiment. This, an experiment contains many pipeline runs. So this name was auto-generated for us. Um, and uh, we're just going to select this. Oh, actually, you may, I, I'm realizing now that on yours, you may not, you may not have this. You might need to create new um, and give that a name if you don't have one. So our, our, you need to have an experiment set up so that each of your pipeline runs can be part of that experiment umbrella. So if you didn't have an existing one, because I know I did, I was messing around with this before I have this one. 
then you just need to click on create new and go ahead and make yours. In my case, I'm just going to select this basic one that I already have, submit. And it'll take a bit for this thing to run. So I'm going to close this down and click on view run overview. And you'll see our, our uh, run duration right here. Depending on, it's really this all depends on which uh, compute instance we created or what type of uh, power we gave this thing. If it's, uh, if we give it the least amount of power, I know when I ran this previously, it took up to a minute to finish. Um, and with big data sets, I had a larger one. It took 10 minutes just to summarize the data to run some basic uh, calculations on them. So it can take a long time. I, I would be careful though, when you are waiting um, and you might be tempted to go create a much more powerful compute instance, yeah, that'll definitely speed things up, but you'll run out of your credits a bit faster. If you don't mind plugging in a credit card and, and you know, paying uh, anywhere from $10 to $30 a month, you can move a lot quicker through all of these examples and uh, save a little time, but it's not necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause this while I'm waiting for it to finish. All right, just finished. Two and a half minutes. Um, like I said before, uh, if it becomes painful for you to wait this long, uh, you probably we probably could use a slightly faster compute instance uh, and still standard our credits. I'll leave that up to you. You can also just have other things you're working on while you're waiting for this to run. Anyway, it's uh, our pipeline is run. Let's right click on summarize data and access data. Uh, oh, sorry, click on it. And let's take a look at what the results are. Now, if you're familiar with the classic version of ML Studio, we used to be able to just right click on this and go to uh, view the results. Again, it's a little more structured in this production environment. So we're not gonna view them here. Instead, we're gonna go over here to our uh, pipelines and we'll see that this is a run. Yours will probably say run number one. Um, within the summarize, basic summarized data or whatever you named your experiment. We're going to click on this one and it has our results. So I can right click on uh, the summarized data, preview the result data set, um, access the re uh, data, register the data. So let's just preview it right here. And here's what that pill did for us. It took our features that were across the top put them down the row here and give us a few other statistics we didn't have before. These first few we did have, but some other useful ones in here are things like skewness and kurtosis. So this is helpful because we know uh, certain algorithms like the linear regressions or linear algorithms have the assumption that, uh, that our, our, our distribution are, is normal for all of our features. And skewness tells us how not normal it is. Down here, this one for charges, 1.5, yep, that's the charges feature. That's outside the bounds of acceptable skewness, which is from negative one to one. So this means that the graph of charges, uh, the, the uh, histogram of charges is, is positive or right skewed. So let me go to insurance and let's preview the data and I'll show you what I mean here. So right here across the top, when we preview the data before, I didn't mention this, but you may have noticed that we have these charts. These are histograms. And so this is the histogram of charges, and you can see that it's right skewed, meaning we have a long tail to the right, and that results in a skewness score that's over one uh, and no longer acceptable. Now look at children. This one is also skewed, but it was just under one. Uh, I think we have that back here, yeah. Children, skewness, that's row or right here, just under. So there's actually quite a bit of room for things to be uh, not normally distributed and still be in the acceptable bounds, but we, we can do something about this. We can make uh, some nonlinear transformations to try and figure that out or fix it, but we won't uh, get into that here. All right, so that's our summarized data pill. Uh, we can use that to do some exploratory data analysis. We've learned how to upload data and we've learned how to find our way around uh, again, brief review, we go to the designer and we use the designer to create 
uh, pipelines. So I click down here and now I have this when I go back to my designer, my pipeline is my experiment. And this is sort of the draft where I can create the pipeline runs from. So I can modify this and every time I submit it, it creates a new pipeline down here. And each one will be stored in a list. And here's where we'll go to access the results at any point. So we can have something running. You can have a couple running if you wanted to and have them generate output runs down here and come back and check them historically. So again, if you're familiar with the classic version, you never saw these. These runs just sh showed up automatically at the end of a finished pipeline running and you could just right click and view the results. You'd have a little green check on the boxes. Um, but uh, Microsoft has, for good reasons, made this whole process a little bit more structured. So after we run it, we just have to come over here and check out the run. Okay, that's it for this video. We'll move on to some more uh, data cleaning steps in the next one.